as well. All right. Let's take a moment. Um, again, I said this last week, but this is among one of the most important parts of our morning, in my mind. When we take a few moments and we say, let's go and prepare our hearts before we enter into worship. Let's not just go through the motions. Let's not just, just come in here and not have settled, not have intentionally said, Father, prepare us for what you want to do. Help us to hear you. Um, so that's what we're going to take a moment and do here this morning. So, Father, we're grateful. Uh, we're grateful for this morning and this day and this place and for your provision that you are permitting us to walk in each week, each month. Teach us what it looks like to be good managers, stewards of what you've provided for us in financial resources, in facilities that we are renting, uh, in the people that are giving time and effort. Father, teach us what it looks like to, to not, not give ourselves to things that don't matter, but to give ourselves to the things that you really want us to be giving ourselves to, that we would celebrate and bring glory to you in these things. So, Father, would you now meet us here this morning? We know you're everywhere present. That's not a question in the minds here this morning is, are you here? Are you present among us? But, Father, what we're saying is we want to enter into that presence with great intentionality. We don't want to come, give mental assent, uh, agree with some facts that may be presented or even some opinions that may be presented, sing some words that sound familiar, and yet all the while just be going through the motions externally while internally nothing is changed. So, Father, would you meet us here? Let your spirit be the presence that dwells among us in this room. If there's anything that's here that's been lingering that's not of you from things that are done in this room throughout the week, Father, would you now cleanse this room in the name of Jesus? Anything that's not from you, silence it and cause it to leave now in Jesus' name. We pray the same for our kids in the rooms that they're in, that you would let your peace rule and reign now among us and among our kids in those classrooms. So even now, Father, would you put your peace upon each person in this room in this moment right now? Come and let your peace rest and abide within and upon each person. And then, Holy Spirit, would you search us and know us this morning? Show us anything that's in us that's not from you. Lead us in the way that is upright. And so if there's things that's not from you that we need to bring to you this morning, show us that we might come and confess that before the Father who is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So take a moment, if he brings something to mind, go ahead and bring that before him. So Father, again, we are reminded because of Christ, crucified for us. It is no longer we who live, but Christ lives in us. And so, Father, the, the, the righteousness by which we are able to stand before you, we acknowledge and we thank you this morning. It's not our own. It is the righteousness of the Savior who you sent to stand in our place, to take the sin that is ours to bear, but yet he bore it on that cross and then he rose from the dead to new life, overcoming sin and death. And he raised so that we might be declared right before you based on his accomplishments. And so, Father, we can now enter the throne of grace with confidence. Not because of anything that we bring, but because of what you have accomplished for us in Christ. So let the cleansing righteousness then of, of Christ uh, that he has purchased for us wash over your children in this room. That we might feel and know the forgiveness and the love of our Father. And then, Father, now will you prepare our hearts to, to hear your voice through your word, by your spirit. Open our eyes that we might behold wonderful things in your law, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys, come on in. All right, so Matthew chapter 7 is where we're at this morning as we're making our way. I'm going to let you get turned there. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 is where we're going to be. Um, I went to Bible college for, well, I went to a Baptist college for one and a half years and then Bible college for three and a half years. And then I went to seminary 
for five years. And I'm not bragging because I don't know that that's necessarily a, a, a thing I would want to brag about. It's just, it's what I did and I'm grateful for it. But I'm telling you that to say in that time, that's almost 10 years of post high school formal training. And I learned a lot. I learned a lot really fast. And I was single for a lot of that time. And so um, I used my time as a single person and I poured myself into study. I, like I would stay in on Friday nights and not go out because I wanted to work my way through the book of First Thessalonians that night. Like that's what I did. Um, and and I, I, I devoted myself to that. So I used that time and I poured myself into studying, learning how to study, uh, poured myself into reading and and, and, and consuming whatever I could to, to, to get the things that I, I thought the Lord wanted me to have. And I learned a lot, and I wouldn't trade that time for anything. And the skills that I learned, I wouldn't trade that for anything. But also, the biggest challenge that comes with that kind of season of life, that kind of training, is the large consumption of knowledge at a fast pace. And, it's, and a lot of it is not even knowledge that I'm I'm acquiring on my own. It's knowledge that I'm acquiring because someone else has spent time learning it and now they're teaching that to me and I'm being able by the grace of God to take it in at the feet of people who may have spent years to get to that spot. And then the challenge is then is taking that in and assimilating it and then the struggle is that's not my own. Right? That's, that's not my level of maturity. Those nuggets, those, those depths of knowledge that I'm acquiring, they don't necessarily match and line up with my level of maturity, my growth. I'm just getting content. But the, the deception is content oftentimes can deceive us. Knowledge can oftentimes deceive us into thinking that we are more spiritually mature than we are. And that's the challenge for a Bible student of whether you're formally trained or you spend uh, time tr uh, studying, whether you are part of a, or grew up in part of a church that is real heavy on teaching ministry, which is a great thing, but that's the challenge that comes with that. I'm saying all that to say, in the course of my study, to be trained as a pastor and to be trained to be a teacher, I, of course, was taught about the importance of prayer. Of course I was. It's in the Bible. Of course I was taught that also, apart from all the hermeneutics, the learning how to study, apart from understanding all the theological systems, apart from, from, from spending time in the Word, of course you also need to have prayer. I was taught that. And I know the, the importance of that. I knew the importance of that. But knowing intellectually the importance of that and then actually living that are very different. And I would have told you a few years ago Prayer is vitally important. In fact, I remember doing an interview um, at one point, and one of the questions I was at, uh, these are silly things that, that we, we sometimes do um, to, uh, to interview people, and we make, I, I was made to, to, to rank the different spiritual disciplines, you know, like one to ten, what's the most important, you know, um, prayer, evangelism, Bible reading, um, giving, serving, like, and, and I'm supposed to rank those one to 10, and like something's gonna be number one, and something's gonna be number 10. And, and you're, you're looking at this going, what a trap, you know? Like, like, in my mind, I'm going, I know the game. Like, if I don't put prayer at the top, like, you're gonna judge me because do you not think prayer is important and it doesn't undergird everything? But then if I put evangelism as number 10, you're gonna judge me because I don't wanna win souls. But then where do I put Bible reading? Like, it's, there's just a no-win situation, right? So I played the game and I put prayer on the top because I knew that's the answer that everybody's looking for. And I got the pat on the back in an interview and, and someone said to me, well, I'm really glad you, you put number, uh, prayer as number one. I was really glad to see that. And I just kind of cringed. I'm like, yeah, I know. Not because I didn't think it was important, but because I just know like, like I would have rather put study the Bible up there. You know, that, that's where I was, you know. So that was my perspective on prayer. Like, I know it's important. But if you give me a choice and how I'm going to spend my time, let's say I have about an hour's time, are you going to dive in and study or are you going to spend it praying? Hands down, I would say I'm spending it praying, uh, uh, studying. Hands down, I'm going to spend it studying. Why? Because I'm just going to pray as I go, right? I'm, just, I'm going to pray without ceasing as I go, okay? This is my, this is my perspective on prayer uh, several years ago. It was very important. I realized that intellectually, but functionally, practically, very different. Um, I would tell you, I despised, I despised 
many types of prayer meetings that I would be a part of because they weren't actually prayer meetings. It was prepare something to be taught and we're going to open and close with prayer. And, I, and again, fine with me because I like teaching, but again, if we're going to call it a prayer meeting, I could just feel the tension inside of me going, but this is not a prayer meeting. Like we're opening, and cl- it's kind of like, you know, we, we pray before our meal and we pray before bed and then we're going to say we're a people of prayer. Like that doesn't line up. And so I felt that tension for, for many years. And the other reason is because I, I, I know how we do prayer meetings. And I'm making fun of me as well because I do this. I know how we do prayer meetings oftentimes. Oftentimes the way we do prayer meetings is prayer meetings are not so much about me coming before the Father and, and, and treating him and pleading with him and, and seeking his face, but it is for me to be able to communicate to the person across the circle from me who maybe we have a disagreement on something and I'm going to, through prayer, communicate my understanding and theology to that person because you won't argue with me through prayer and I won't argue with you through prayer, but we're going to get it said, right? And so that oftentimes can happen, Right? And so these are the ways, and that's not to say that some of those prayer meetings didn't have people in them that were sincere and had a different perspective. This was my perspective. This is why I would would sometimes cringe because I knew inside of me, one, I thought those meetings were a waste of time. You're going to give an hour to pray? Like, let's go do something. Like, this is how I am wired. Let's just go do, pray as we do, right? And, And so... All that to say, as I throw myself under the bus, several years, I guess we're approaching eight, nine years now, uh, I was already pastoring. Okay, all this, I was already pastoring. Eight, nine years ago now, I know I got on a, a road that drastically changed the way I understood prayer, the value I gave to prayer, the perspective I have on it, and then how I go about it. And verses like what we're going to see this morning in Matthew 7 are among some of the types of verses that I would read and I'd say, amen. Now, let me explain to you what's going on in the Greek or the Hebrew. And none of that is necessary in order to get the punch of what you're going to see in these verses this morning. Also, what I hope and I'm expecting that the Father is going to do this morning as we go through this is some of you have been praying You've been asking, you've been seeking, you've been knocking, you've been asking for some things for a while now. I've asked and I'm expecting that for some of you in this room, if you are willing to entrust yourself to the Father this morning, he's going to answer some of those. Or he's going to take you further down and give you the breakthrough in that wall that you feel you've been hitting this morning as we look at this. But here's where I think we have to go first. And this is something that I think... Uh, has helped shape me. And by the way, I would not even pretend to get up here and say to you, let me teach you about prayer because there are some of you in this room I would say, we're gonna talk about prayer, let me get you up here and talk about prayer because there are people in this room and there are other people that I know, you, you go to battle at all hours of the night. You go to battle and no one else, I get to stand up here and, and tell you what I've learned or how it's changed for me. Some of you, you don't get to do that. You just do it. You go to battle. And people will never know that you spent an hour or two hours in the wee hours of the morning praying for that person or that person because the father woke you up and said, do it. And you did until he said, you're done. So please hear me on this. Um, But here's what I think is important for us to understand. When we know the character of our father in heaven, then we don't stop coming to him in prayer. But it's important as to how we understand his character. That then shapes how we come to him in prayer. And I'm, I'm going to give you some illustrations here in a little bit. I think that will just drive this home. But when we know the character of our Father, we don't stop coming to him in prayer. So Matthew chapter 7, just, it's just a few verses. I'm just going to read 7 through 11 here. Matthew chapter 7, 7 through 11. You've heard this before. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, 
How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So Matthew chapter 7, now I'm going to acknowledge right up front, these are verses that do get abused by certain groups within Christianity. Uh, We would call these groups prosperity gospel people. Sometimes we might uh, lump them in with word faith. Uh, We might sum it up by saying health, wealth, prosperity, right? These are the types of verses that you have heard if you turn on to the TV stations or if you follow certain people on YouTube or whatever, you've heard them go to verses like this and they will use them to teach you that whatever you want, do you want a new vehicle? And God can give you a new vehicle. Absolutely. I'm not saying that. He gave me one. I'm, I'm thankful for that 2009 GMC Sierra that I got in 2018. I asked him for it for years. I drove by Diffie Ford and Lincoln for years. I'd stick my hand out and said, Father, if you'd be so pleased, I would love a truck one day. Now, I got the truck that I was hoping for, and I'm grateful for the truck that I have. He could certainly provide that. But oftentimes what is presented instead is you should have the best because God only gives the best, which means brand new. And that oftentimes comes with all kinds of signatures of wealth. That might be a certain size house or a certain number of houses. That might be certain types of vehicles, whether that's on land or in air, right? And so it can be used for things like that. And I want to first acknowledge and say I'm aware of that, and I'm going to show you why these verses protect themselves against such abuse, all right? But Jesus says, ask, seek, and knock. Context matters. So, so he has said in chapter 6, he taught his disciples how to pray. This is important. With everything that I just told you that I wrestle with as a teacher, as someone who's been trained, as the type of emphasis that I've had, what strikes me, and this is somebody else who pointed this out to me, it's not my own, is that Jesus never taught his disciples how to teach. He never taught them how to preach good sermons. He taught them how to pray. And yet our schools that train us, people like me, Most of them emphasize how to teach, how to preach, how to lead according to the wisdom of men. They teach us good skills. I'm not not trying to take that away. I wouldn't trade my time. But somewhere in there, the overemphasis on study, knowledge, right theology, right theology, and how to study wins over how to pray. And yet when we look at the scriptures, it's clear that Jesus' emphasis was how to pray. And, And he taught, and he taught his disciples how to think, but he didn't do it in the way that we teach people how to do that today. So we've got to get our priorities flipped. And so he's taught them in Matthew 6 how to pray. When you pray, pray like this. He's taught them um, about when you practice your righteousness through fasting, here's how you should do it. When, you, when you're going to um, uh, store up uh, treasures, make sure you're storing them up in heaven. He's taught them about, hey, don't let anxiety, anxiousness win over. Instead, seek first the kingdom of God, and then all these things, your needs will be added unto you. Last week, we looked at, he, he's taught them, hey, um, be careful how you judge others, because that same standard is going to be put on you. And so then now he's going into this. I think in Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, because Luke has these as well, and we're going to see this. But I think with Matthew, what Matthew's starting to do as the Sermon on the Mount is winding down, is you're going to start to see him going, and then Jesus said these things. And then Jesus said these things. And he's kind of just given a snapshot of this is something that he taught as well. And this is something that he taught as well. And so with Matthew, you don't have as, as clear of a context of maybe where this might have been included. But Luke's going to show us. And we'll we'll get there. So Jesus ask, and it will be given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. Now, this is important. This is where it's helpful to do the kind of study that I was trained to do, that every one of you are fully capable of doing. It's looking at what's the verb tense? What's the verb tense? I know it's boring. I I know when you come to the scriptures, a lot of times you go, I don't want to read it like I would a history book or a grammar book. I want to read it like um, a super spiritual book that has secret hidden meanings, and I hope I can find that nugget. But the reality is the, the scriptures are written down in a culture, in a language, and in order for us to understand them, we have to apply the same types of rules that we would if we were reading a history book or a fiction book or any kind of book that we read. We understand the genre. Is it narrative? Is it history? Is it poetry? Because that determines how we understand words. 
and sentences and phrases. We have to understand when was it written because Shakespeare used language that we don't use today, so I have to understand how he used the word, not the way I would use that word, right? We would apply the same rules. We have to do the same thing here. The verb tense matters. And so here we have present tense verbs, ask, seek, knock. Here's what's important to understand. That could simply be action in general that's taking place, ask, seek, and knock. But in the language that the Bible was written, that Matthew was written in, and particularly in, in the Greek language, this really gets pulled out. When a present tense is used, it can also mean continuous action, not just one time that's being captured in a general sense, but continuous. In other words, we would say, keep asking and it will be given to you. Keep seeking and you will find. Keep knocking and it will be opened to you, right? That is, that is a legit understanding. The question we have to ask is what did the, the writer mean and did he, did, he, did he have that in mind? I'm gonna show you I think he did, okay? But ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened to you, okay? We don't necessarily have specifics given to us. What are we asking for? We don't have what are we seeking for? We don't have what are we knocking for? Context can help here. But, but right now, ask, seek, knock. That's the verbs. That's the action. But there's also a progression there. I'm asking, I'm asking the Father for something, I'm asking, but now I'm asking, but I'm also going beyond asking, I'm seeking. So seeking would be I'm asking, but now I'm putting action to my asking. I'm with intentionality, I'm pursuing that. I'm seeking it out. I'm not simply just asking, I'm asking, and now I'm seeking. And then the next progression is I'm asking, I'm putting action to that asking by being intentional about seeking it out, and now that action is becoming more concrete. I'm knocking. I'm knocking. I'm I'm stepping out, and that door that's closed right there, now I'm knocking that I might be invited in. I'm knocking so that that door might be open. There is a progression here. Ask, seek, knock. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. And so maybe just for the moment, just just stop there for a moment. Maybe you've been praying and asking the Father for something for a while. And you have been faithful to keep asking and it will be given to you. You're, You're clinging to that. But maybe you've never gone to seeking or knocking. You've stayed in the asking. And maybe, maybe the Father has, has, has led you to a spot, and, and maybe you know it, and maybe you, you don't, but, but maybe he said, I hear you. Well, now, seek it. Seek it. Act on it. You're, you're asking me for this. You're asking me, an example, you're asking me for a certain person to come to faith in Christ. You're asking me to see more people uh, from a community come to faith in Christ. You've been asking. You're faithful in asking. Have you started to seek that? Have you started to go into that community? Have you started to to try to have those conversations, look for those opportunities to speak to someone about my son? Have you seek? Have you not? So some of you may, you may be paused right here and asking, and and the scriptures tell us, ask, seek, and knock, right? And so he says, ask and it'll be given, seek and you'll find, knock, and it will be open to you. Then he's going to explain to us, Why? Why is this true? Because everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be open. You're like, okay. He's just telling you, ask, because if you ask, it'll be given. Seek, if you seek, you'll find. Knock, because if you knock, the door will be open. If I just quoted those verses to you, then I can teach you anything I want. If I just quote those verses to you, then I can tell you to ask for anything you want. I can tell you to ask for anything you want regardless of whether it is opposed to who God is and what he has instructed his his people to do. Because if I just give you this and I preach a sermon on this, there's no parameters, there's no guardrails. You have a desire, it doesn't matter if the desire is evil, ask and it'll be given to you. You, 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 want, you, want a, um, you want something that's luxurious and, 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 and is going to make you uh, increase in status among certain people. It doesn't matter if you're looking for the glory of yourself. Seek and you'll find. You want that new home, that door to be open to you so that you can enjoy all that, that square footage maybe that, that people will then praise you for the knock and that door will be open to you. Like if I don't give you the rest and if you don't study the rest, then there's no parameters here. But clearly... Clearly, it shouldn't be that way. This is where Luke comes in. Because Luke has some of the same verses. So when you think about the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 
Matthew, Mark, and Luke we call the synoptics, which means same or similar, because they have a lot of the same material. They just, maybe they have different perspectives on it based on who's, who's the, uh, the recipients or who the writer is or what the writer's purpose is. There's not a contradiction between them. Sometimes material is included because the people that were reading it needed uh, uh, an explanation. Sometimes material is not included because it's just taken for granted that the people reading it already know this. Those don't constitute contradictions. You have to understand, well, what's the purpose? Who's the audience? Who's the writer? Okay. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, very similar. Oftentimes they overlap. John kind of stands on its own, has some things that are similar, but, it, but also a lot of different unique stuff. Here's Luke. Right before, in chapter 11, verse 1 through 4, is where Luke records the version of Jesus teaching his disciples to pray. Our Father in heaven, let your name be holy. Right? Okay. And then he goes in this. He tells a story having taught them how to pray. He said to them, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, Though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his, impru- his, his impudence, his perseverance, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. So this is the, the parable, the story, the illustration that Jesus goes, he's taught them how to pray, our Father in heaven, let your name be holy, and all, all through that. And then he tells them the story, you have a friend. And now you, you have somebody who's dropped in on you late at night. In an Eastern culture, people are traveling, they needed a place to stay, it wasn't hotels. The inn was not likely a hotel type of thing. It was a house with extra rooms. Somebody's going to stop in on you. They need a place to stay. Your family, it doesn't matter if you're cousin or not, your family, you're going to host them if you can, and you're going to provide a meal for them if you can. But someone stopped. They didn't, they didn't have email, phones, text, calls, none of that. You couldn't tell them, hey, I'm planning to come to you at this time. It could just happen, right? And so that's the situation. Someone has dropped in on you. And now you don't have the supplies you need to be able to offer the adequate hospitality, which will bring shame upon you if you don't. In a culture where honor and shame are important, if you don't offer appropriate hospitality, it's bringing shame on you and your family. So you want to be honorable. And so you're going to your friend, your neighbor, who you know has supplies. The problem is most of the homes are one, maybe two rooms. One, maybe two rooms, which means the same room you live in, the same room you cook in, is also the same room you sleep in, which means everybody's sleeping together. I've told you this illustration before, um, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, right, with Gene Wilder, that version, the opening scene with Grandpa Joe and the other grandparents, I don't even know their names, but the, the two sets of grandparents in the same bed, right, they're all just sharing the bed because that's where you slept. It's all in that same room while the mom is in, right, like two feet away cooking from them. That's more the setting that this would be. And so you've got a dad who's in bed and all his kids are in bed with him. And you know, parents, you know if your kids are sleeping with you and you finally got them to sleep in that bed, you're not getting out of that bed and risking waking them up when you finally got them to sleep. Because if they get up, your window's gone, right? I cannot get up and give you anything. Because my kids are already in bed. We're all shut up. And Jesus says, he may not get up and give it to you because you're a friend. Which you would think would be the higher calling, right? Hey, it's my friend. I'll do anything for my friend. Jesus says, he may not get up just because he's your friend. But if you continue with perseverance to ask him and to knock on that door, guess what he's going to do? If he doesn't stop knocking on my door, he's going to wake these kids up anyway. And so because of your perseverance, he will get up and give you what you're asking for. Now, I just put in some inflection in that, nor me, nor do I think Jesus is trying to think that God's going to get annoyed with you and that you should try to annoy the Father because in your annoyance of him, he'll finally cave. That's manipulation. And we don't manipulate God, all right? But the picture is clear. Persevere, persevere, because the next thing that Luke's gonna tell us is ask, seek, and knock. But before we get there, let's go back to Matthew. So he's just said, ask, seek, and knock, because if you ask, it'll be given. If you seek, you'll find. If the knock, the door will be open. Verse 9. Now, which of you, if he has a son, asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Daddy, I'm hungry. Can I have a piece of bread? Sure, son, here's a rock. Right? The, the illustration speaks for itself. 
Or verse 10, or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a serpent. Dad, can I have that fish? Son, here, here's a snake. It's got scales, just like the fish does, right? You, you wouldn't, right? The, 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 the illustration is clear. Verse 11, if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? I'm about to lose my stand. If you then, who are evil, Yes, every person's impacted by sin because Adam's sin, death spread to all people because all sin, Romans 5.12. Yes, we're impacted by Adam's sin. We cannot stand before God apart from his grace extended to us through Christ. Yes, that's not, that's not meant to be the, 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 the oomph here because you're evil. Really, what's, what's, what's going on here is Jesus is saying, when, when you compare you, earthly father, with the heavenly father, you're evil. He's not. It's not, it's not trying to be a statement on total depravity here. This is not meant to be a statement about the depths of the impact of sin. It's just meant to be a contrast between earthly fathers and heavenly fathers. And earthly fathers who are tainted and infected by sin, and we do things out of selfish ambition and for selfish reasons because, listen, I don't want to give you a piece of bread right now because I just sat down. Right? Yeah. Right? That, that, that's something I would do. But that's not something the heavenly father would do because he doesn't have that selfish motive within him. Okay? He's simply just trying to contrast, hey, if you, an earthly father, and all your frailty and all your failures, even you know how to give your kids good things when they ask. And you don't give them things that are going to harm them. How much more will your heavenly father give good things to those who ask? When you understand the character of our father, you won't stop coming to him in prayer. But it matters how you understand the character of your Father in heaven. Because based on how you understand the character of your heavenly Father will determine how you come to him. If you have a picture of your Father in heaven who is a scolding Father who can't be bothered and anytime you come to ask of something, you're going to be met with shame, condemnation, uh, maybe some, some, some scolding or some harsh words, then you won't ask unless your life depends upon it. And what you will do then in prayer is, only when my life is in jeopardy will I go to him. But for everything else, I will make my own way because I don't want to bother him. I don't want him to be disappointed in me. I don't want him to be upset or annoyed by me. I'm going to walk on eggshells. Or on the flip side of that, if, you, if you, you have an understanding of the Heavenly Father that He is an extravagant, doesn't care, has no parameters, no boundaries, just you, just you want something, fine, it's yours, just tell it to the, to, the, to, the, to the nanny and she'll get it for you, you know, something like that, right? If you have that kind of understanding, then what that's going to breed is entitlement. And you're going to think the Father owes you things. And you're going to, to, to come to him with an entitlement and an expectation that is not holy, but instead is just entitled. You owe this to me. Don't you love me? The way you love me, will sh you'll show it by what you give me. And so that's a very different approach to the father because when the father then says no to your desire for something that will harm you, you have no way to receive that because your entitlement of an expectation won't allow you to receive no. But if you understand that what a good father looks like is he, is he is loving, he is kind, he is gentle, and yet he has boundaries. He has parameters. He has things where he has said, this doesn't lead to life for you. It leads to death. And I'm unwilling to give you things as my child that leads to death. Now, Fully acknowledge there are places in scriptures where over time, yeah, you do keep seeking things that give death. At some point, the father may say, chase after it. Romans 1, chase after it. And there will be this downward spiral. You wanted it so bad, you rejected me, you rebelled against me, you wanted it. There it is, you can now chase after it and it will leave you wanting. There are places in scripture like that. Jesus' point is, hey, when you come for something that you need, or even something maybe that you desire. Like, it's a good thing. You have a father in heaven who loves you. And if you, as an earthly parent, know how to give good things to your kids when they ask, your heavenly father knows so much more. He's not going to withhold good things from you. But how I understand the character of my father in heaven 
matters how I approach, and it affects how I approach him in prayer. Here's the rest of Luke. So we pick up with Luke, having given that illustration about knocking on the door and getting some, some provisions. Then Jesus, in Luke's account, says, And I tell you, ask, and it will be given. You seek, and you'll find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if a son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? So, so Luke puts that in a different order than Matthew. That's not really a problem. Same illustration, a fish, and you get a serpent instead. Verse 12, or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. That's different. That's different from Matthew's, but the illustration is still the same. I'm asking for something that would be good and, and beneficial to me, and then instead I'm giving something that can harm me. And then look at this. See, Matthew ended, um, how much more will your Father in heaven give you good things to those who ask him? That's how Matthew ended. Look how Luke ends. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Well, isn't that interesting? Luke just goes ahead and says, and maybe Jesus said it at some point, point. Matthew's kind of captured that by saying good things and includes other things. It's certainly not just limited, but what is one of the best things that the Father has given His children? In fact, guess what? You cannot become his child apart from this because it is the spirit of adoption, Romans chapter 8, that then testifies with our spirit that we are, in fact, children of God. I am adopted into the family of God when I am given the promised Holy Spirit. Now, Luke is not... Luke is not talking about asking the Father for the Spirit unto salvation because he's already writing to children. He's talking about children, right? And so, so he says, how, uh, how, how many of you, if you, if you know how to give good gifts, then you, even though you're evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him? I don't think he's getting at, hey, I, I need to be saved. Now, hey, listen, you haven't entrusted yourself to Christ, you don't have the Spirit. Romans chapter 8, Paul would say, if you don't have the Spirit of God, you don't belong to Him. Okay, that, so if you don't have the Spirit, if you've never entrusted yourself by faith, ask, because all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But I think what Luke's getting at is children who already have the Spirit asking for good things, which includes more empowerment, more of the Spirit. Not that there's, there's more of the Spirit to indwell you, okay? Here's some theology for a moment. When, when you become a believer, you're indwelled by the Spirit. You get the fullness of the Spirit. It's not like there's a quarter of God in you. It's the fullness of it. The question becomes, how much of that empowerment are you now living in and walking in? How much has been unleashed, so to speak, okay? So if I, I'm desiring more of the, the, the pow, empowerment of the Spirit, and I'm asking the Father for that, that's a good thing. Why would the, the Father withhold that? Now, there's some parameters on this. This is Psalm 37. Trust in the Lord and do good. Good has a definition. It's not nebulous. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Faithfulness has a definition. It's not nebulous. Delight yourself in the Lord. To delight yourself is got a definition. It's not nebulous. It's already been defined in the instructions that God has given his people. And he will give you the desires of your heart. You don't get to delight yourself in the Lord in whatever way you want. You delight yourself in the Lord in the ways that he has instructed that we should delight in him. So to delight is, yes, to enjoy him, but to enjoy him in the ways that he has said, this leads to life. This leads to death. So to delight yourself in the Lord is to be faithful in obedience to living in accordance with his ways. And, and, and like David would say uh, many times throughout the Psalms, I delight in your Torah, in your law. And then when you do that, then he'll give you the desires of your heart. Well, guess what happens when I'm delighting myself in the Lord? The desires of my heart come into alignment with the desires of his heart. I don't get to bring my own fleshly desires and say, this is what will make me happy, and that's opposed to, to the Creator, and say, I'm asking, I'm seeking, I'm knocking, because the Father, who is a loving Father, will say, but that'll bring you death, and I cannot do that. 
So there's parameters there. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness at, as the light and your justice as the noonday. Here's another one, Psalm 84, verse 10 through 12. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. But I've been asking, and he hasn't given me the desires of my heart. Okay, well, let's take an assessment. Is there unrepentant sin in your life? Are you actively living in sin? That could be actively pursuing rebellion. That could be holding on to things. Are you actively living in sin? No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. If I am unwilling to deal with the sin that's in my life, not perfection, but if I am unwilling to, when I become aware of sin, to confess that sin and then to repent of it, to turn away from it. If I'm unwilling to do that and instead I'm saying, no, I don't want, I'm, I'm going to let that stay, then it may be that he is going to withhold some things from you for now because you're not at a spot to receive them. Because you wouldn't use those things or appreciate or value those things as you will when you're walking uprightly. Okay, there's, there's parameters, there's there's boundaries there. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. When we know the character of our Father, we don't stop coming to him in prayer. There's a lot of ways this can be applied this morning. Continuous prayers that you've had for people, for desires in your life, for healing physically, um, soul. Could be for certain gifts of the Spirit that you have not um, experienced yet, but that you're longing for. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 14, earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially that you might prophesy. So for me, as I'm growing, and my understanding of the Father wants to give good things to those who ask him, uh, I started asking the Father in 2016, 20, 20, somewhere around that, that time frame, for things that I'd never asked him for before. Father, I want more of what you want to give. If there's more empowering of the Spirit that you want to give, I want it. If there's other spiritual gifts, up to that point I would have told you I probably am operating in, in teaching gift, maybe, maybe one or, other, or two others, but I would have never put on some of these other gifts that I at that, that, that time started asking. Father, I would long to see your Spirit in power to bring healing. I would long to see your spirit and power so that I might receive words of knowledge, words of prophecy for, for the, the betterment of your people, for the glory of God. I started asking in 2016. Today's November 10th, 2024. On November 6th, 2022, uh, that trajectory drastically changed. I'd been praying for several years at that point, six years, I guess, at that point. And I had walked by someone who had a foot injury. She was in a boot. And I did a quick 20-second prayer. Can I pray over you? One of my daughters was right there when that happened. I uh, followed up with her, her parents uh, that Friday. That was a Wednesday, that Friday. And they said, you know, the pain that was there from the boot, she was on boot end crutches, the pain that was there had significantly decreased and there was only one spot left hurting. And I said, hey, um, let's, let's get together Sunday morning. At that time, I had an office that was not Iron Tree. And um, I said, let's get together Sunday morning and let's ask the Lord if he will finish that off. And that was Sunday, November 6, 2022, in my office at that time. We prayed and uh, she took off her boot and she could stand with no problem. Um, she had no pain. And the doctor, she was going to go to the doctor on Monday and was maybe going to get to get off her crutches. On that Monday, she played in a basketball game. Heel fracture, tendon torn, I think is what it was, plantar fasciitis, and there was one other thing, and all of that had been taken care of. My life drastically changed. That was November 6, 2022. November 7th, it was a Monday, 2022, praying with someone. Uh, someone in this room was with me for that one as well. And uh, we saw lupus get healed. And that one can be documented by blood documentation before markers and after markers, gone. That was November 6, 2022. 
Then Thursday, November 10th, two years from today, one of the highest points in ministry for me, still the date at this point, had a person come to my office. We were going to visit about uh, some questions they had. I could tell the questions were sincere, but this person was not a believer, and that was the greatest need. It took about 30 minutes and walked through the gospel. I could tell at a certain point when the Spirit of God hit that person. I hadn't even finished giving the gospel, but I could tell it. He was, he was already doing it. And uh, as I finished up, that person says, that's what I need. And I said, that's what's available. And then we prayed. And that person became a believer. That day, November 10th, 2022, one of the most drastic changes I'd seen up to that point. I also knew there were some other things going on with that person. And so we talked about health-wise. Because this person had some significant trauma in their life. And we had talked through that as well. And then we prayed for osteoporosis. And some things happened. And that person, not because I advise them, because I don't give medical advice. Let me be clear on that for a moment. I don't give medical advice. I tell you, you go talk to your doctor, you consult with your doctor, and you seek the Lord on that. I'm not going to tell you to get off your medicines. But if you're going to ask me my opinion about your medicines, I got opinions about your medicines. Right? But I'm not giving you medical advice. So I told that person, I said, you might consider paying attention because of what just happened here to how you feel over the next few days. And then you might talk to your doctor about that. Not today, Satan. Now, I might talk to your doctor about that. And that person got off their medication and they didn't need their medication because from all accounts, and I can't tell you it's medically documented, the osteoporosis was gone. I can tell you that person didn't need the osteoporosis, whatever the medicine she, she was taking, she didn't need it. November 10th, 2022. And then the list just started growing from there. But that was six years of praying. And in that, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things that I didn't see happen. There's some people that died, even though we prayed. There are some people who are still battling with the things that we've prayed over. Got to be honest about that too. But when we know the character of our Father, we don't stop coming to Him praying. I, I, I'm still not stopping because those things, to me, those things, not to me, and according to scripture, those things are evidence of the kingdom of God coming to bear. Because the son rose from the dead and is seated at the right hand of the father, his ministry continues through his people. That's the book of Acts. And so I kept asking, kept asking. But the reason I felt like I can continue to ask is because I knew now the things I'm asking, I see them in scripture. They align with who you are. Now, there's things that I've asked for that I haven't received, and I would long for them. There's some of the things you guys have asked for. They're good things, and you would long to receive them, and you haven't. But unless he has said no or stop, then don't stop asking. Because it may be you keep seeking, keep asking, keep knocking, and it's coming. It may be that in that process of you keeping seeking, keeping asking, keeping knocking, there are things taking place within you that have to take place, that have to change, that have to, to, to be undone and relearned as you continue to ask, as you continue to seek, as you continue to knock. And then one day he's going to say, now, now that you've learned all that along the way, remember this that you've been asking for for six years? There, you weren't even looking for it today, and there you go. Right? That's my example for this morning. What is it that you're asking for, seeking, knocking? I want to take just a few moments and I want you to bring that before the Father. Maybe you've already stopped. I want you to start that back this morning. Unless He has said, My grace is sufficient for you, if, he, if you've heard that, then you better walk in His grace. But if you haven't heard that, then keep asking. It doesn't matter if you don't have all the answers to your questions. Why is this person not changing? Why is this person making these decisions? Why haven't I seen it? It doesn't matter if you have all the answers. It doesn't matter if it makes sense to you. If you haven't heard the Father say, no, or my grace is sufficient for you, keep asking. Revive that prayer this morning. Revive that. So, Father, right now in this room, let your spirit brood among us and stir those things up, those prayers that have been asked and those things that have been sought for and those things that, that maybe even they were knocking for, but they've laid them down because they're tired and they're weary, because they've maybe given up or maybe they've resigned themselves to say, it's not for me, 
But that's not your answer, that's theirs. Father, let your spirit stir that and revive those prayers this morning. And give us a new clarity of a vision of your character. Help us to understand, reshape, and help us to unlearn the, the, the baggage that we oftentimes can bring to a picture of a father. And so, Father, where that's not right, where it's not been a good picture or a right picture, undo that this morning and instead give a clear picture of who you are as our Father in heaven, that we might then come to you and continue to ask, continue to seek, continue to, to knock that we might know that, hey, these are good things that we're asking for. And if they're not, you're going to tell us through your word or you're going to tell us no by your spirit in some way, by your people, you're going to tell us that. Or you're going to say, my grace is sufficient for you and I will receive glory as you continue to bear up underneath this. And that is an acceptable thing when it's from God. There's glory to be had in the suffering when it is from God or it's ordained by God. Father, go ahead and express those prayers this morning. Revive them now. Father, hear the prayers of your people, your children in this room this morning. And Holy Spirit, I would ask even right now in this moment where prayers are being lifted up, that you would give a moment of encouragement right now, that you would make your children in this room aware of your presence right there with them, that you would help them, your sons and your daughters in this room, to know and to experience your affection for them as your son or daughter right now in ways that they know is from you. Father, we lift up to you the people that have been brought before you whose hearts need to be softened to the gospel that they might respond in faith. We lift up to you, even in this room now, the people who are asking you for healing, physical healing of things. That, Father, you would let your spirit come and bring healing mercy now upon their bodies, to their minds. For the soul wounds in this, wo in this room, past trauma, memories, Father, even now, you would bring healing into that. for broken relationships that need to be reconciled or restored. Sons and, and, and fathers, daughters and fathers, sons and mothers, daughters and mothers, siblings. But Father, you would bring restoration now in this room. And that you would soften hearts where they need to be softened. That you would bring repentance where that's needed. And Father, just where there's a callousness in the room, a resistance to, to maybe something that's been abused in the past, can certainly be misused. People who have put words in your mouth and attached your name to things that are not from you and it's left people resistant to anything that smacks of that. Father, would you bring some clarity in the midst of that to who you are and what's from you and what's not? So increase discernment in this room and among us, that we might know what's from the Spirit of God and what is of a different spirit. And then teach us how to pray, even, even greater. We might see the power and the glory of God extend beyond here and into our community and into our world as they prayed in Acts 4, stretch out your hand and do signs and wonders as we proclaim with boldness the word of God. Come, Holy Spirit. We want to see demonstrations of power and of the Spirit that our faith might not rest in the wisdom of men but in the power of God. Amen. Amen. Oh, that's good.
Are those kids out there? If they're out there, you guys can come on in. So listen, some of you, some things are happening for you. The Lord's speaking to you. Take note of it. Don't write it off. Maybe you had a stray thought that seemed to come out of nowhere. Don't write it off. Maybe it was a memory you haven't had for a while that just came out of nowhere. Don't write it off. Maybe you felt something and now you're going to say your temptation is, but the, the heater was on and I probably got flush. Listen, the heater's been on the entire time I've been preaching. If you weren't flush, don't write it off. Right? Pay attention to these things. You are a whole person, body, uh, soul, and spirit, and the Lord will work in all of that. So don't write it off. Clue into it. Maybe write it down. Take note of it. What did he whisper into your soul? Come on in, you guys. Learn how he speaks. Come on in.